you know, once upon a time, I was very, um, I would say angry. I, I, I don't mind accepting that, that I was very angry. Um, and when I spoke surrounding historical events, that anger was reflected. You could see it in my face. You could hear it in my tone. It was very angry, very harsh. And it is only through maturity and, and time, you know, and the, the ability to grow that I've come to recognize that the energy was better spent in other ways versus, you know, expressing anything, you know, historical or otherwise from an emotional place. It's not really an emotional place any longer. I don't, I don't have my emotions tied into whether or not somebody understands what it is that I'm saying or can relate to what it is that I have experienced. My emotions are no longer connected to that. Um, so I don't have to speak in the manner with, with, with anger. I can kind of speak to things just from a historical perspective relative to how they are um, important today. So from my perspective, when we are visited with Independence Day, right, I recognize the value and the importance of independence in a human being's life. I recognize that there is it is one that does not have their independence should be spending every second attempting to attain it right anything that is not free you trap any species of animal you trap them and you cage them and the entire time that they are in that cage, the only thing that that species is attempting to do is get free of that cage. This is true of pretty much everything and anything, right? Um, so I recognize the importance and the value of independence. I am well-versed and familiar with the various movements associated with the Revolutionary War that occurred in America. Um, and one of, and I won't go too far, I'm, I love history. I'm a big fan of history and, and the majority of these uh, historical events have many fronts that are not presented and from a historical perspective people don't see some of the underlying elements associated with these engagements and these wars. One of the chief, one of the number one most relevant and most commonly not discussed elements associated with the wars, the currency wars. This was, it, it, whether that was the Revolutionary War or the Civil War, it was the currency wars that were the most fascinating. It was the most fascinating because that was the, that was the true crucible of independence, right? So Britain, the, the, the money that was being exchanged and used in America was British pounds. <laughs> right? They were using shillings. And as a result of them using British money, they were able to tax them and the taxation was heavy. They didn't have any voice. It was, it was sucking their blood, <laughs> similar to what they began to do later on. But the, the intent was to remove themselves from dependency on Britain for her money, for her security, she didn't need, they had already come to North American continent. They had already um, starved in the winter in Jamestown and cannibalized their own children. They had already encountered the native on this continent and began a process of genocide. They had already done these things. They had already captured people from Africa and brought them here to work. They had already done these things. And so they were able to manage their own water, their own food, right? Their own utility. They could, they, they were burning the wood and they were, so they could do these things for themselves. What Britain was doing was Britain was providing very little, <clears throat> but Britain, Britain was providing 
um, some military assistance relative to fighting with the native on this continent. But they were also uh, providing goods. There was trade back and forth between them. And as I mentioned, the currency of the day was British shillings. It was British pounds. Okay, So there was a taxation that was in place as well. So the colonists and the people that were here in North America in the 1700s, 1600s, were paying taxes to Britain. Okay, And this is what really started to bring to a head the, the need for revolution and the, the need for them to seek independence because Britain was sucking their blood. Um, and they had no choice in the matter, you know? It was being run like a monarchy, and they didn't have any choice, and so they determined that they needed independence. They needed to no longer be dependent. Now, as I mentioned, they'd already had control of their own water, their own food. That was a local. That's a local consideration, right? So they had their water. They had their food. They had their security. This is where, this is where it, it kind of moved forward. Uh, so they were managing their own essential needs. And that is all they needed in order to be able to say, wait a minute now. If I'm managing my own essential needs, why am I paying you? Why am I dependent upon you, Britain? Right? And that is what drove the American colonies forward relative to their independence. Now, uh, again, when you look back through the history books and our history teachers, which were all terrible, all terrible, I condemn all of the history. Well, I got, I had a history teacher uh, and I had some, I had some educators, you know, that was, that was pretty on point. Um, but majority, yeah, they haven't taught the people. The people have no idea about history, truly. They they can't differentiate what was false from what was true, right? There's no chronological order to it. There's no basis, no context, no framework. There's nothing. So the history teachers uh, throughout the world have failed you. I'm, I'm sorry. They have failed you because they have not given you a true glimpse of what was happening, why it was happening, and the reaction. So when you look back at the Revolutionary War, all you think about is Lexington and Concord. And this happened, absolutely. But more relevant than Lexington and Concord and the, and the, the men on the field and the various uh, movements of war were the fact that they were meeting up in Nova Scotia, the uh, so-called American um, aristocracy, and the British aristocracy were meeting in a neutral zone up in, no in Nova Scotia. And they were sitting back, drinking tea, making jokes, having fun. It was a different... So, again, war is fought on many different battlefields. And, and the Revolutionary War was no exception to that. There was a, a currency-based component. There was the political voice as a component. There was um, the honest negotiation right this was a this was britain and this new colony creating a working relationship for the future is what this was sure there were fights and skirmishes and people died right people died fighting in this war but it was less it, 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 at the gentleman's level <laughs> at the gentleman's level up in uh, nova scotia it was a very different thing okay but at the end of the day what was clear and, and consistent among everybody involved was the need to diminish dependency on britain there was no reason why these colonies needed to continue to pay britain for being alive what are you doing? You're not helping me. You're not keeping me alive. I'm the one that's breaking this, this ground. I'm the one that's planting these seeds. I'm the one that's, that's uh, diverting water and producing a dam for myself and filtering my own water. I'm the one that's raising my own livestock. I'm the one building my own house. Why am I paying you? 
So there came a point where the colonists had to say, wait a minute, I'm a human being. Why am I paying Britain, why am I paying the king simply because I was born? Simply because I'm, a, because I'm alive. I'm not even within your kingdom. I'm not even in your contiguous kingdom. Why am I paying the British monarchy? Is what the colonists had to confront themselves with. And so they confronted the issue. They got together. Many events happened. You heard of the Tea Party, right? And the Tea Party happened. I'm right here in Boston. The Tea Party happened in uh, the Boston Harbor, right? Um, and again, taxation without representation. They poured out the tea into the Boston Harbor that they had just purchased from the British. <clears throat> and they poured out their tea in an act of defiance. And then many efforts happened and, and the war began. Okay, Now, my great 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 grandfather third generation grandfather fought in the revolutionary war when he was 13 years old i'm sorry 16 years old he was 16 years old he fought in the revolutionary war when the fighting was over he was ordered back into slavery that places a seal over every conversation surrounding independence and freedom. For if he was in fact fighting for his own independence, at the end of that fight, at the end of his service, why would he have to buy his freedom? Right? How is it possible that this human being was ordered back into slavery? Right. So this is kind of the, the irony associated with the Independence Day. But further, it doesn't make me angry. Again, as I said, I removed emotion from historical study and, and understanding. There's no emotion to it. It simply is. I, I look I let the facts present themselves. And, and then extrapolate. What does it mean? What is useful, right? What, what can I take from this and use? Well, what we can take from it is that a group of people that left Britain came to North America. And when they got here, they recognized a dependency that existed between themselves and Britain, and they had to question, they asked the question of themselves and each other, why, why do I pay that man to be born and pay him to die? Who is he that I and everything that I ever do should benefit him? Who is he? Who am I? Am I an entire whole human being? And if I am, is it not relevant? Can I be a whole human being while I am dependent upon that man? Right? So America had to come to a decision. They had to do something in order to solve their problem. And it was the right thing. What they did was the right thing. We will fight and we will die, but we will not be dependent upon another man. Not one more day will we do that. And that level of courage, that level of conviction, that determination of action forward should be commended. That is exactly what should have done. I guess my only question is, how comfortable are we serving 
as the jewelry around the neck of white supremacy, jewelry and adornments around the neck and ears of white America, how long will we be comfortable and proud in a place where we are dependent upon another man? So many challenge me. They, they, like, what happens is they, they are used to a lot of talkers that, that share their opinions or what they think. Absolutely nothing that I'm sharing here has been my opinion or what I think. What I'm illustrating is complete fact, right? This is what it is. This is what has happened. This is our disposition. If one word can be challenged, please do. However, I'm careful to ensure that I omit my opinion and only speak to those things that can be verified. Okay? So we can verify their disposition, what they did, why they did. We've walked through that. My question to you is how long is it appropriate for us to be white America's jewelry hmm? hanging around their neck? Close, close. The only one standing close to the former master is the former slave. Close to him. Close to him. So close. I can't determine where his foot begins and my ass ends. Huh? So close to him that even the questions or the statements that I make are challenged. I say dependent. And all, all the black people around jump up and say, I'm not dependent on him. Oh, okay. All right. I get it. You're not. You're not. You're not. Just every other human in the United States of America is dependent upon the system to provide their food, clothing, shelter, water, health care, security, sanitation, education, utilities, and economy. Maybe not you. Right? Maybe you exist in the 1% and this is not true for you. If that is the case, then I speak to the 99 percentile for whom this is true. Okay? So my question becomes, if it was inappropriate for them and they did, they acted by any means necessary. It was appropriate for them. It was the right thing for them to go to war, to seek their independence from Britain. It was appropriate. It was the right thing for them to do. Absolutely. With every lens that we can possibly apply, based on what they were experiencing, this was 100% the right thing for them to do. My question is, why is it not for you? Why is your dependency so comfortable? How many different ways are you right now as I speak? How many different ways are you justifying being dependent upon another man? Uh, I don't mean to be harsh. I don't mean to be harsh. But let me tell you something. Every All of the justification as you're listening to my words, as you listen to me speak, everything that, that jumps into your mouth that says, no, it's not, you know what that is? That's cowardice. It's cowardice. Because not a word can be disputed, can't be challenged. It's a fact. You, yo, know, and, and here's the problem. Here's why, I, here's why I will define it as cowardice. Here's why I abhor it so much. Because what I am actually saying to you is that you are a whole human being, just like those colonists were. You are a beautiful, unique, organic, independent, amazing human being. And so were everybody in your family. I'm saying you do not deserve to live not one more moment thinking that it is okay for you to be dependent upon another man. I'm telling you that is a fact. You are far more beautiful than that. And if, if disallowed from expressing your beauty, it will, it will, it will crush up, it will, it will wither, it will die. 
Do you hear me? And you will cease to be the organic being, that beautiful being that you were intended to be, that you were created to be. You will cease to be that and you will be a character of what has been provided for you. I suggest that what they did to produce their July 4th, their independence was 100% correct. I'm asking you, when do you matter? I'm not talking about a shirt and a LLC and we march around and scream we matter. No, I'm asking you personally, when do you matter in your family? In order for there to be, <laughs> in order for there to be a you, okay, in your family, in 20 generations, that's going back to 1619, 1619, in order for there to be a you, that means that there were 1,048,574 grandparents in 20 generations in your family. I'm not talking about cousins or uncles or aunts. I'm not talking about siblings. I'm talking about direct grandparents to make you. 1,048,574. And not one second, not one second in any of those human beings' lives was normal. Not one. Not one second in any of those innocent human beings' lives was spent in anything that we could consider normal. So how long are you comfortable the way you are? How long are you truly comfortable in a dependent state? How long will this be normal for us? How long is this enough for a whole human being? How long is it enough? Hmm? Yo, again, I love you. I love you. I love you. I'm needing you to love yourself. I'm needing for you to look at your, your position, man. It's not a good look. You hear me? It's not a good look, black people, and we fighting each other because we ADOS or FB1 or Pan-African or this. I call myself that. I got a cute little hat and I walk around and call myself. I don't care. Yo, yeah, we, you, you fighting man against woman. And, and it, but you don't see nobody else on the planet Earth doing that. You don't see no Chinese women doing that. Chinese women or men. You don't see no Russian men or women airing it. You're just an entertaining little, yo. You entertain the world. White America's jewelry. Put that shit down. Stop being uh, uh, satisfied. Being white America's jewelry. Determine that you are a whole human being. Determine your own worth and value absent everything that white America has placed before you. Determine it for yourself. Love yourself. You hear me? And then when you do, the condition, the disposition, you look back and see yourself and you will not be able to stand it. And it is at that point that you will change it. Okay? Peace.